her son who had very severe uh, extended belly and hard belly and chronic eczema um, and chronic uh, eczema rashes all over his body, life threatening food allergies. Uh, allergies to proteins in saliva, animal saliva. So there's a uh, protein in the dog and cat saliva. Uh, so if he came in contact with an animal or a dog or was licked, uh, he would you know, morph into an elephant and all of his uh, uh, mucous membranes would close up. So we essentially were in a situation where collectively we had 21 chronic diseases in our family of five even though we were actively pursuing health, making our own food, cooking at home. Our children have never been to McDonald's, Burger King, Dunkin' Donuts. They've never had fast food. Um, we cooked at home. We exercised. Uh, we were a loving family. We were sort of you know, just going through the motions. And we were trying to figure out what, it, what is it that uh, got us into this situation. This is a picture of me. Uh, at 35, and underneath that sweater on, on the left-hand side, I have a body brace that was custom built for me from my ribs uh, down to the lower part of my hip, and that was to stabilize uh, my torso from moving because I had such severe chronic pain after post-operative co complications, uh, which left me uh, with a conversion disorder, which is post-operative paralysis following a back surgery, and that's what spiraled into permanent disability for life. Um, I then developed early stages of MS where I started losing my sight, and then chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, fibromyalgia, chronic pain syndrome, and uh, was essentially told I would be on Social Security till the age of 65. So this was, you know, our new life, and we had little kids, and I lost the job that I loved. Uh, and capital markets and investor relations, and we had to figure out what is it that we were going to do, you know. And so this is what people, I, I know it seems like an extreme case uh, in the sense that, wow, that's really unbelievable for any one family to, to deal with, but the reality is every family in America is doing the same thing. And I know because they're all in my clinical practice, and all of their intake forms have the same data. So it, it's everywhere, it, and it's just each one is piling on top, and it's just all getting layered on, okay? And so when you sort of un, when you lift that veil up and you look at it, that's what it looks like on paper. So this is us coming out the other end, and this is the children. And so what I really want to talk about, because really I'm, I'm I'm fast forwarding, I'm taking a very complex situation, okay, that happened over 10 years, and I'm compressing it into a story, but I, there are some very, very key elements that we're going to talk about here that you really need to understand. And one is, I, I needed to understand why couldn't we get better, okay? We were doing physical therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy. My son, who was diagnosed at three, had eight years of intensive therapy. Speech therapy three times a week, occupational therapy three times a week, physical therapy three times a week. Therapist coming into the house, therapist at school, me driving him into specialist at Hasbro. Intensive therapy. So a very concerted effort of trying to help his system correct, okay? We, had, we went to counseling because he was nonverbal, and so we used all kinds of behavioral therapies. We tried supplementation, exercise, gluten-free diets, dairy-free diets. We removed processed sugars, all the food dyes. We did massage therapy, hydrotherapy, cranial psychotherapy, acupuncture, meditation, music therapy. There wasn't a therapy that we didn't try. We tried everything. We're open to anything. So what was it that prevented us from having full resolution? And that was the, we got better and we were happy. We loved each other. He was very happy. But we were actively managing chronic disease using lots of therapies and interventions as a full-time job. So I, as a full-time job, had to go to therapy all week. I had to take him to therapy all week. I had to take care of sick parents. And then I had to take care of other, other children at the same time and then ask for help and have people come over and help us in a body brace on narcotics. 
And so this was a very profound thing that I had to cope with of how is it that, you know, what was getting in the way. And this was ultimately what we ended up figuring out was that the chronic, very low exposure of glyphosate in our diet created just enough of a burden on the body that prohibited the connection for those therapies to take effect permanently. In other words, just enough to keep a lot of that cellular membrane and the interconnections in the body from it essentially damage the body, just enough, and I say low level because we weren't you know, eating tons and tons of food that it was just enough of a chronic level, a chronic exposure a little canola oil in the gluten-free pizza that was in the, free, you know, in the freezer that we had occasionally. It was sort of tucked in the crackers, in the, in the cupboard, in the, in the foods. And then, okay, it damaged the microbial allies that we had missing now in the gut microbiome. So we couldn't get the nutrients into our cells. And therefore, we were missing the building blocks to repair restoration. So we were doing all of that work right, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy. We could get a sound in isolation, but we couldn't get it to translate to conversation in real life. So we could get the body to make a sound. We could get physical therapy. I could get a certain movement in isolation. So if I was using my walker and I had this uh, a gait, like I looked like I had a stroke. So I would use my walker and I would sort of drag my torso behind me but I could go to physical therapy and the physical therapist would work with me and I could get to a particular point where I could get a certain movement, but it wouldn't translate to normal walking. So the body had some capacity to do certain things in isolation, but we couldn't get full engagement of the body to do other things. There was no carryover, no connection of the network. And it was this system, okay, the microbial system, that was prohibiting that full-on healing to happen, okay? So when, I, when I, we talk about this, and I know you've heard about it all weekend, what I'm really saying is that we, I at, was thinking that I was human, right? And that, I had, that our bodies had failed us, that my body had failed me, that I had worked too hard, I had a high-stress career, I was putting in 12 hours a day, and my body had just failed me. But really, I had failed to recognize that I was the host to a microbial and ecological community that I had failed. And so when I realized that that's ultimately what my job was, to serve as a better host, and that I was, in fact, not human, but an ecosystem, and I switched my attention to serving that purpose, I was able to do that. So when it comes to looking at disease, we have to think about it really is the terrain, the underlying condition. Okay, so we're gonna sort of shift our focus now, and I'll bring you full circle around about what that might have looked like with these disease, but I'm just sort of setting you up that we have all of these conditions in the body, they're manifesting differently for each person, but we're gonna bring it back down to that central point. The terrain being the host, including the microbiome, the microbiome being the fungi and the virome, and of course I'm not including parasites, but they're also included there as well. And then the ecosystem is even spanning out further than that, which is the interconnectedness of the organisms, plants, microbes, and their environment. So our terrain and then our terrain within the ecosystem. So when I initially started thinking about the microbiome, I know there's a lot of focus on the gut, but of course we have a microbiome throughout our entire body. Our nose, your mucosal tissue, the lungs, the vagina, the skin, uh, throughout. So I was very curious about all of the ways the disease was manifesting in our family through eczema, uh, through autism, certainly with the brain, uh, pain signals for me. Uh, my husband had developed a gynecomastia, which is a benign breast tumor. Uh, so I was, there were a lot of different manifestations of conditions within our particular family, bronchitis in the lungs. And I was trying to figure out how do we, how do I get access to all of these different touch points uh, in a single family, okay, and then, so I was looking at the microbiome in terms of its diversity and its widespread connection throughout. So initially I thought, well, let me just understand essentially the map of the microbiome and the human uh, microbiome, which is the fungi that also connect those organisms. And again, we're not going to dive into those, but it's just for you to recognize that 
all of those surfaces have these different organisms that are working together symbiotically. And then, of course, the virome, which is helping those bacteria to communicate using uh, different phages and things to send information and genetic information back and forth. So these were the three key areas that I was particularly interested in in terms of how that network was working together. Now, for the sake of the healing process, I knew that the, the primary access point was going to be the gut because this was the way that we all generally have access to healing. We're bringing food into the body on a regular basis, and this is uh, essentially our invitation and our connection to the outside world. So this is the easiest way for us to think about it. Certainly, we're, we're also exposing uh, ourselves to the outside world through other ways, but this is primarily the way we want to be thinking about it, that our gut microbiome has a primary focus because this is an, uh, an, an easy access point that we're bringing the plants that are in the soil into the body uh, and the foods that have them. So initially, this was how I figured that we would you know, make that initial invitation to the healing process. Um, and so the question that I really had was, how is the gut microbiome going to access the health of the whole body? Well, two things. One, it's going to reduce our vulnerability, and two, it's going to have to nourish resilience. So I knew that we were going to have to essentially uh, reduce our, our ability to um, be vulnerable to these conditions and diseases, and then two, use them uh, as a powerhouse to access parts of the brain and to help us. So that was sort of the mentality that I had. And with that in mind, said, well, you know, everyone really has, we all have the same type of assaults, right? There's an infinite number of assaults that are creating inflammation, oxidative stress, and in immunological dysfunction. And so uh, when somebody is getting sick, essentially what we have to recognize is that the, that the human body is not self-correcting. It's getting an assault and then it's not behaving, it's not um, responding well. So, you know, stress or environmental stress or things that come into the body that are potentially damaging or like s stressful stimulus, that's never going to go away. We're always going to be exposed to stressful stimulus. And the body should self-correct and self-heal. So the two primary questions you, you first want to start with when somebody is sick is, is there any individual need to lift the burden off the body? In other words, is the body taking in some type of toxic exposure, or does the body have an unmet need? In other words, is something missing from the body, prohibiting the body from getting well and getting itself well? So those are the two primary questions that I start with. And I'm going to give you some very specific examples, because again, I think it's important to look at examples and what it looks like before and what it looks like after. So this is a close-up, a medical illustration of a close-up when you look at that intestinal lining and what happens you know, when we have that vulnerability and when something should self-correct. So when you have the tight junctions get compromised and things get where they shouldn't be, then essentially the body can become weak. So this is an example of when there's a toxic burden or when something comes into the body, in this case, a small amount of glyphosate coming in and compromising, what it might look like in the case of my son Trace, and this picture, it's not uh, easy to see, but right here, these are just the creases of the back of his legs. Uh, he had very raging eczema, um, which was bleeding. Uh, it was red, red, raw, and blood was always like coming down the side. His skin was always cracked, but everything was cracked. His skin. His entire torso was covered, all of his arms, and I took him to immunologists and allergists, and they said, you know, you need to put him on steroids, and he needs to take um, all kinds of pharmaceutical drugs, and he was two, which I thought was just ridiculous. Um, this is three weeks after removing glyphosate from his diet, and it never came back. And this is the same thing. This is a distension of the belly, which is just a swelling uh, of clearly his torso, uh, was, was in distress, and then, you know, you can see what happens uh, when the body can calm down. So the body was very responsive, uh, even though that was a single uh, exposure to canola oil that was in one gluten-free pizza in the freezer that he had uh, on occasion once a week. So for him, a very small dose was enough to keep him in a perpetual cycle of irritation. 
and we tested every other ingredient in the home. Was it whey protein? Uh, was it rice? Was it everything? And we had ruled it uh, down, of course, uh, to that final ingredient. Um, this is another specific example of my son, uh, Stephen, who had apraxia. Is anybody familiar with apraxia? Uh, there are, uh, apraxia is, you can have it of apraxia of the mouth, or you can have apraxia of the body. Uh, it is a brain condition that uh, is an inability uh, to perform any particular purpose, or purposeful purpose, uh, due to brain damage. So uh, he could not speak. Uh, he could not execute any movement of the body uh, on command. So if you threw a ball at somebody who has apraxia, it would hit them in the chest before they put their arms up. Because the time it would take their brain to tell their arms to come up, to catch the ball, uh, would not fire fast enough. Okay, because the execution of that task, the connection to the brain, to the body, to send that motor planning skill, uh, would not fire. And they tend to have um, low muscle tone, so they're like floppy kids. They're very soft. Uh, they don't develop muscle. They usually have um, uh, tongues that shake, uh, stuttering, motor planning disorders. Uh, even if they do speak, they usually have sp speech disorders, uh, which he did, a very profound speech disorder when he actually did speak. And um, so you can see that there is this uh, motor planning or inability to participate in sports, couldn't do anything that required any coordination due to brain damage, okay? This is, I shouldn't have been just because it killed me. Um, this is what it looks like when you heal the body, okay? When you get a body and a brain to regenerate. Because you can get, you can get the brain to refire, okay? The brain can reignite and reheal, and the muscles can develop. So how we define brain damage, right? You know, to say somebody has brain damage, which you know, he had for 10 years, and now he's 15, right? So you know, from age 11 to age 15, you know, it's clear that uh, there is no sign, no speech disorder, completely normal speech. Uh, no sign of deficit and medically undiagnosed with autism. <laughs> so, I'm going to take a sip on that one. It's worth celebrating. Yeah. It really is, yeah. It, and it, it always is worth celebrating, and I don't want to minimize. Uh, I don't want to minimize the challenge. I think it's, it's so critical to understand uh, the extensive work uh, that goes in, but to then appreciate what happens uh, when the microbial community meets that effort, because I think that's sort of the underappreciated aspect of it and what we're missing certainly in the clinical world is that when we have a good microbial environment and the ecology is there, then the children and or the patients or individuals are benefiting from the, the therapy. Do you understand? They're getting the benefit from the therapy because the brain is then able to use the nutrients that are being provided in the food. And this is what really needs to happen because it's not just about bringing the food in. We have to be able to get the food into the cells. And the only thing that's going to do that for us is the bacteria and that ecosystem. So it really is an incredibly important part of the conversation that that really has to happen. Um, and then it isn't just that we have to change the ecosystem and have healthy microbiomes, because if you're not willing to do the work, then essentially you, know, you can't just have a healthy microbiome but then not put that effort in. It's really both. You have to do both. So when somebody has had an illness or somebody is trying to come back from an illness, they really do have to do that other piece. They have to be willing to put in the effort and give that information back so that the microbes can make that assist for you. It's a two-part piece. And I cannot stress that enough. And this is why some people don't have the resiliency. Some people are not coming back from illness. They're eating a perfect diet. They're eating organic food or they're doing, but they're not really actively engaged in that healing process. So we'll talk more about that. This then led me 
uh, to asking another question in my clinical work, which was, why were some people getting better and others were not? What was the difference between the people that were coming and saying, I have these chronic conditions or I'm not well, and I'm doing all of the right things? And I was really struck by that, because people would say to me, um, I work with medical doctors and teams of medical doctors, and they'd say, Kathleen, you know, why did you get better and other people don't? We have such a great population of people, they're really devoted to wellness, and they're not doing well. And they're doing all the right things. So what differentiates somebody, you know, like you, uh, and are you just sort of an anomaly, you know, you, you do it because you, for whatever reason, you're just one of the lucky ones. And I have to really uh, think about that. And so I've, my, my next book, which comes out in 2020, answers that question, hopefully, or attempts to. I'm two years into the writing, but uh, it's a really important question and a really hard one to answer. Um, but I think it's something that we have to think about, which is that it really is about resiliency and our ability to adapt. And I think that what's happening right now in the functional medicine and integrative medicine world is that, yes, we've done a good thing to move away from pharmaceutical interventions, but now we're getting into disease management using supplemental protocols. Uh, we are still, unfortunately, managing chronic disease. We're just using safer practices. So I'm not sure people are really getting better. Um, and so this is a really tough thing. I think people are doing great work, and practitioners have really good intentions. Um, but I think we need to talk about what regenerative health care looks like, and it doesn't look like disease management using protocols and therapies. So resilience to me was really that adaptive process. So having some type of trauma or illness and then our ability to bounce back. You know, what does that look like if we do get sick, if we do have an infection or if something does happen we have a car accident or we get ill, can the body come back from that? Can we get back to that state where we actually feel like we can have, you know, down times? We can have periods in our life where we're just not doing well. And I think that that's okay because, in fact, when we have stressful periods, when we have sickness in the body, that actually is a really great thing for the body to go through because we can upregulate certain processes in the body. The healing response in the body can actually be very good for the body, like the fever. You know, if you get sick and you get a fever, you actually upregulate glutathione in the body, which is your master antioxidant. So we don't necessarily not want to be getting sick and not want to be having these stressful stimulus. These things can actually make us a little bit more resilient and a little bit more strong. So the idea is to not go through life and, and not be uh, not feeling well all the time or to not have these types of things, but of course to be able to, to have periods of lows and bounce back. So this led me to what I uh, am writing about now, which is uh, resilience uh, and looking at these three areas, our beliefs, behaviors, and bacteria, um, because I really feel that our belief system, um, and not affirmations, but how we really view health, um, essentially is our thoughts, and that is really driving the consistency of our behaviors and our daily habits, which ultimately drives the ecosystem of your inner terrain. So it is in your daily habits that ultimately uh, determines the diversity of your microbiome, and it is your diversity that determines your tolerance for life. So when you have a diverse microbiome, you have a tolerance for all things in life your tolerance you know, for exposures, environmental exposures, and certainly for other types of um, microbial exposures. So this was the loop that um, I really began to write about. And I feel that um, you know, in order for us to heal, we really have to return to that state of innate capacity to heal and start getting back there. So I'm not that, I don't, I don't want people to misunderstand that I'm anti anything, quite frankly. I'm not anti supplements, I'm not anti acute care, I'm not anti anything. I just really feel strongly that you need to be using any and all of those systems to your benefit. You have to choose when they're appropriate. You have to know how to integrate them into your life, and you have to know when they're appropriate. You cannot be relying on other practitioners or other people to dictate what it is that you need for yourself. 
So uh, this is part of that belief system, and I thought, well, you know, these sort of lay that foundation, and we need to have a more global view of what it is, what are, the, what are those beliefs, and so it sort of came down to um, these six overarching areas uh, that may seem abstract, but they're pretty complex. Um, the first one was uh, values, and I'm not going to dig into them. They're probably too deep for us to get into today. Then we'll all start crying again. It won't be pretty. <laughs> but, um, but I'll just say this, that uh, in terms of values, and these are the things that showed up consistently over and over again, certainly in my clinical practice, but even all over the world, you know, when I'm speaking with large audiences, these are the things that always come up and certainly was true for our family as well. Um, the first one is values, and this is about congruence. Um, a lot of people think that they're living in congruence, but uh, congruence, you know, being, in other words, living true to your values. And I'm going to give you a very specific example of where this uh, actually d doesn't show up. So when you have somebody that's sick in a household, uh, what often happens, whether it's yourself or somebody you care for, uh, people will often put that individual on a specialized diet or a plan to get well uh, in an attempt to help them get better while everyone else in the family continues to do their own thing. That is living in conflict. What you're doing is you're not living a congruent life because what you're doing is you're saying you're ill and you need to go on a specialized diet because you have an illness. And we're over here, disease managing, I, we're going to call it disease free because if they're under the illusion they're disease free when they're not, because if you can find somebody that's disease free, you can bring them to me because I'd like to meet them. Um, and, and essentially, uh, they, they, you've, you've already right there created a problem because you've disconnected uh, the family. You've created somebody who's sick by themselves to fix themselves. And the rest of the family is sort of doing their own thing, and we've separated the unit. So to really master congruence, what you do is you use the person who is ill as a collective call to action. In other words, they are the canary. They are that person that is going to change the way you live. You are going to say, we all value health. Everybody here is important, and this is the re we are going to do this together forever. Not for a month, not starting January 1st. We're going to do it forever. What is important to us? What do we value? And then what does that look like in our life, on our plate, in our hearts? And then how do we, how do we live that? And what happens when you do that? is that the microbial community of every single member of that family shifts. And then you start swapping microbes with people that are actually healthy. Because when you change the diet of one person who's sick in a family, and their microbes are trying to change, but everybody else in that family has not changed their diet, they keep giving them back shitty microbes. That's what happens. So I would run microbial testing on family members of children, let's say, on the spectrum. And we would change their diet. And we would get them to be in a better position. And they would have constant regression. And then I would say, let me see dad's DNA. I want to see his microbes. And he would be covered in all kinds of pathogenic microbes that he was then swapping back and forth with his vulnerable child. Now, how am I supposed to change permanently change the microbiome of a vulnerable child when four of the members of the family are infested with disgusting pathogenic microbes because they eat disgusting processed garbage. Right? I mean, seriously, people. We've got to help each other out here. This is. This is what I'm saying. And when, when I stopped treating my illness and my son's illness and realized that, no, we were, in essence, all not doing well, and we just said, this is unbelievable. Like, we have to all do this together. We really have to own this. I, th I really think that the reason why Stephen's recovery was so profound was because we pulled him over the finish line. 
We want to think about these microbial metabolites as a way uh, that they heal the body. Um, they're also using uh, secondary bile acids and short-chain fatty acids as a way uh, to support our healing process. They're also making essential brain chemicals, so uh, producing the neurotransmitters uh, that make us feel good, serotonin, GABA, um, histamine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. So again, we want to be thinking about the fact that when we are uh, thinking about restoring our health and thinking about honoring that, those microbial allies through our daily life, that essentially we are really building in that pharmacy within the gut. Um, we cannot honor our microbial allies if we're abusing them and, and essentially getting rid of them with antibiotic use. So the risks are huge. Um, the average child in the U.S. by the age of 18 has received 10 to 20 courses of antibiotics. So this is a very uh, difficult thing because um, we know that uh, once the decision is made, of course, to, to wipe out the microbiome, then it's a very difficult thing for us to reestablish. Um, but I think we need to really be careful about decisions on making anti uh, taking antibiotics and then, of course, recognizing that glyphosate is an antibiotic uh, and that when we take in a chronic exposure of glyphosate every day, we are essentially removing uh, microbes from the gut. Uh, feeding our microbes, prebiotics and probiotics. So I am a big fan of using real food. Uh, to re-inoculate the microbiome. They need both food to eat and they need the microbes that are living on the food. So um, zucchini, uh, kiwi actually has microbes on the skin. So we usually just eat the entire kiwi. Uh, not, we don't take the skin off. So that's where all of the, the, pro, the bacteria are living. Um, and they actually are making now prebiotic and probiotic foods out of kiwi. So you'll often see supplements that are made from the very foods uh, that we could be consuming. So it's, it's often better, if you can, to consume the products, uh, the, the whole foods, uh, instead of a capsule. Um, and then feeding your own microbe uh, a very diverse diet. So giving them all of those rich fibers is critically important so that they can grow and produce short-chain fatty acids, which then produce mucosal uh, tissue and, and mucosal um, secretions to heal the gut lining. So these are just a small sampling, but for you to just reflect on the fact that you literally have to feed the microbes living in the gut. Um, intermittent silence is another behavior that I think people need to execute. And I'm relating it back to the gut in this particular instance. I know intermittent fasting is very popular. I call it intermittent silence because um, we also need mental silence. And people just need to stop. They need to stop with the phones and they just stop with all the stimulus and the TV and all of the input coming in, and that includes food. So we have so much coming into our bodies that we are not creating periods of silence. And there are certain things that are happening when the body is in a dormant and relaxed state. Um, and that includes uh, cross-feeding. So the bacteria are also cross-feeding and communicating with each other. There are certain types of bacteria that don't even uh, use up inulin-rich uh, polysaccharides, they actually feed off of each other's byproduct. And so they're cross-feeding with each other only in the absence of food. So if you are shoveling food down all the time, you are not allowing for the proper space for that to take place. So these exopolysaccharides, or EPS, are really this cross-feeding is taking place uh, during a time when there isn't food present. So we really want to create this, allow A, the symbiotic relationship to happen amongst the bacteria, but you also want to create silence in your life, moments of silence. So it's really a two-part message there that we don't want to be stimulating our, our central nervous system with data and information and technology all of the time, but we also want to be creating these intermittent silence and periods of rest for our digestive system. We also see this with people who have fungal overgrowth in the small intestine. Uh, that can be often a sign that people are just grazing a lot and they never really allow time and space for bile acids to get released that actually flush like a detergent up in the higher uh, part of the digestive system. So we actually have normal secretions and things that take place uh, in between meals that will sort of cleanse the small intestine and keep it clean and keep a lot of fungus 
out. And when people are not allowing that to happen, then they get prone to small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, uh, which is known as SIBO, or fungal, and then they get that hard distension and the swelling and the bloating. People say, I'm very bloated or swollen, or I can't get rid of my, my hard stomach, or I'm, I'm feeling like I have a lot of gas or swelling. And that's often just a really a significant sign of di digestive distress. So we then have to really look at, rather than trying to say, oh, you need to take digestive enzymes, or you need to uh, fix, you, you need supplements, or you need to take probiotics. Or you, so this is our tendency, right, to just jump right in there and start throwing all of these things to fix it, is to sort of look at what is the behavior and lifestyle that allowed that to happen, created that imbalance, and then let the, the, the body actually correct that. And there can sometimes be very slight modulations. We can um, incorporate bitters back into the diet to upregulate hydrochloric acid, create a little bit of an acidic environment, and create some stimulus for that digestive acid uh, to, um, to stimulate the stomach, and then have some bile acids released. So we, we really want to think very specifically about the mechanics of the body and the natural systems that take place before we start rushing in to, to correct and, over, and, and overfix something and then lead to a problem. Save that so I'll, I'll, um, I'll get back to it. Um, so the next thing uh, is, of course, to get outside. This is the same message of re-inoculating or uh, your exposure, of course, to microbes in nature, but then also to, uh, to breathe and take in those terpenes that are available in nature. Uh, because this is really what you're going to do to lower your cortisol and increase your DHEA. So we have to remember that time in nature is critically important, not only to our exposure, but to reset our circadian biology, to get back out and to lower our stress level. It's critically important that we get ourselves back out into this natural rhythm and allow the body to reset. And you don't have to do it for long periods of time, but you do have to do it, and you have to do it on a consistent and regular basis. So incorporating that in your life whenever possible. Um, the third phase is bacteria. And so these were some of the lessons that I learned from the microbial community. Um, which I thought was really interesting because, of course, we could talk about um, the microbes and all of the fascinating information. There's an incredible amount of literature on the microbiome, which I think is always so fascinating. But I was more interested in what are the lessons that they have to teach us because, um, again, I'm a systems thinker, and I think that we have to sort of learn you know, from them. Uh, in terms of human health. And the first one was partnership, and that um, together is better. Now, we certainly know that on humans that we, we really do operate better together, because here we are at this incredible conference, learning from each other and being together and learning together is really powerful. But the microbes um, seem to have the same relationship. So this is an example of um, sinus bacteria that apparently seems to be uh, in check when they operate together. So this was a particular study uh, where they looked at uh, patients who had sinusitis, and they had a very specific skin bacteria in the nose versus the healthy, um, the healthy subjects. So the healthy subjects had a, another type of bacteria, a lactobacillus bacteria. And uh, what they did was they found that the people who had sinusitis had this, this skin bacteria, although other healthy subjects also have it. So it's, it's not just the presence of that bacteria, but it seemed to be an abundance of it in patients who were prone. And they were undergoing sinusitis surgery, OK? So then they took the ba that bacteria, the skin bacteria, and they inserted it into mice. And in fact, they got sinusitis. And then they took the other bacteria, which is lactobacillus, uh, I think it's uh, psyche, uh, psyche, and they put that into the mice, and they did not get sinusitis. And then they put them both together, and they did not get sinusitis, which means the lactobacillus psyche controlled the skin bacteria. So the combination of those two bacteria together meant that one bacteria was in essence keeping the other one in check and in control. So it wasn't just the presence of the bacteria that typically leads to sinusitis, but in essence, it was there only when it was in isolation that it created a problem. And we can use those other microbes to really keep that balance in check. 
So we have to remember, because people ask me this all the time, if I run a lab test or if I look at my own microbiome, could I just make decisions about my, my health by looking at my own microbiome? And I said, you could, but good luck. <laughs> it could be, you know, it's, it's unless you really uh, understand that there is this incredible sophistication of partnership happening, uh, you might potentially overcorrect something that's there for a reason, which is, again, what we see with fungus. Fungus tends to overgrowth in children on the autism spectrum, um, which was certainly the case with my son. And I inherently knew, well, it must be doing something good. It's clearly the fungus is there to help him. Um, why would I eradicate it if, if, you know, if it's overgrowing, it must be there to help? Now, I don't know why I thought that, but that's what I thought. And I never eradicated that. I said, I'm just going to change the terrain so that whatever fungus is there will get back into its normal balance. And that's exactly what happened. Um, and so we never addressed it again, and it was never an issue. But I never went after the fungus because I just knew that uh, the microbes were more intelligent than I was. And I wasn't about to go at war with them. So we have to remember that they are trying to preserve human health. Okay? This is another example. This is a ketogenic diet. Uh, we, if everyone is familiar, that ketogenic diets are used in seizures. So epilepsy uh, is used quite effectively and well studied. Um, so in a ketogenic diet, there are two specific bacteria that are actually very dominant. Acromantia and uh, Parabacteroides are elevated and protective for anti-seizure behavior. Uh, and they are pretty dominant when somebody's on a ketogenic diet. So the researchers looked at this and then, of course, using germ-free mice and mice that were treated with antibiotics, getting rid of their microbiome, gave them a ketogenic diet, and they had no protection against seizures. So that meant that the ketogenic diet did not provide protection against seizures because there was no presence of bacteria. It was, in fact, the combination of the ketogenic diet in the presence of the two bacteria. So it really is the combination of the diet, which we already know is effective for epilepsy, in the presence of those two species together, not by themselves. If you put the ketogenic diet with any single one of those species, it doesn't work. They have to be together. So there is this partnership that they work together to create a protection for the brain. And so it's such an important message, and then it makes you think even again, if you have somebody who's using a ketogenic diet, which then creates an abundance of these two bacteria, and then you treat them with antibiotics, let's say, for an ear infection, and you wipe out their microbiome, right? And let's say you get rid of those two species, do you increase their risk for a seizure? Right? And but you, would you know that? Would, would their doctor know that? Probably not. And so there are, there's some, just some really important things for us to think about that these microbes are really providing this incredible protection for us. And do we understand when we're vulnerable? And what is creating that vulnerability? Would we then say the ketogenic diet didn't work, or the diet was not effective, or it was something else? And so we really want to be more thoughtful about what it is that's creating that protection and understanding, that self-knowledge, that, that understanding that relationship. Okay, So it's just a, a really interesting thought. Maternal separation. So this is a study looking at what happened uh, when it was a maternal separation. So the, the baby away from the mother drove uh, a change in diversity and motility of the gut microbiome uh, significantly. And so this uh, led to IBS and uh, change in diversity um, significantly. Uh, at the time of separation. So what we're really, and we've known this already, that there's a the strong um, gut-brain connection, but that element of stress, right, between human connection and its impact on the microbial diversity uh, and the motility of the colon, and how profound that is, that human connection, and what it really is doing to the human body. And so again, it reminds us uh, of just how profound, right, that the the microbes are reacting to all of our choices and to our lifestyle. Missing microbes is another example. Um, Prevotella is a particular strain that is actually um, 
they looked at in the autistic community and it tends to be uh, very low. And we know that Prevotella is a particular species that really keeps those tight junctions in the, in the intestine uh, tight and it's one of those early species. So again, that would um, beg the question, are we, uh, if we're low in that particular species, are we having some vulnerability and some compromised uh, intestinal permeability that makes the brain then vulnerable? Um, and then the Prevotella species is very dominant in certain populations in Africa where they're eating a lot of fiber, uh, rich carbohydrate fiber, and, um, and it's lower in, in certain types of um, diets that are more dominant in um, protein, so they tend to be rich in bacteroides bacteria. So again, this isn't going to be true for everybody, but we know that if we want to have an abundance of that particular species, which might be lower in the vulnerable population, in order for us to grow that, we would want to increase fiber. And same thing with bacteroides fragilis. This modulates the immune system and can prevent excess inflammation. So we can, you know, use that kind of information to help with certain types of inflammatory conditions and help uh, modulate that kind of uh, behavior when there's already systemic inflammation in the body. So with that in mind, um, I just, I want to leave time for question and answers, but I wanted to touch on the fact that um, with this in mind and thinking about uh, resiliency, I, I again was sort of left with this question of, you know, where are we going in the field of health and what am I seeing in my clinical practice and what am I seeing in the population? And I just still feel like, you know, it's still very focused on disease pathology and I still feel like we're doing so many great things and we're heading in the right direction, but I still feel like we're managing chronic disease and I still feel like we're troubleshooting um, and we're not spanning out and we need to move faster because there's just, it's, there's too much illness and it's, it's too widespread. And what's also happening is we're still treating individual patients one at a time and we're not teaching enough people so that they can then pass it down to the next generation. So if people don't have enough of the right data, so if you're just treating each individual person, then they get well enough, but they don't have enough, they don't have the right kind of data to then teach their next generation or their children. So they're not fully understanding what it is, they're not understanding the model. Um, and so that's the part that really bothers me because I feel like for me, I could really teach my children. I, I broke the cycle by saying, you know, I watched my mother die of cerebellum ataxia, um, which is essentially the cerebellum shutting down, um, which is completely preventable. And due to ignorance of conventional medicine, uh, she is no longer here. And so then, you know, to see the trajectory of our family, I had to break that cycle from my own children and say, I'm going to teach you a different way. And you can do this a different way, and you can and start that. And I really think that needs to happen as opposed to us just um, continuing to individually select each, um, each person. So right now, practitioners are, have moved away from you know, labeling the disease and you know, forgetting to treat the patient. But now we're sort of focused on treating the patient. And we sometimes forget to treat you know, the ecology of the terrain. And then for the ones that are actually doing that, they're now hyper-focused on managing the terrain and have forgotten to observe the ecology of the environment. Um, and I think that's sort of the next place that we need to go, um, which is to span out and say that um, we can't micromanage the microbiome for each individual person and start throwing individual customized probiotics at every single type of condition. Um, the suppression of symptoms, of course, is, you know, profitable. It's a better business model. My ideas are not that profitable. I'll probably go broke with the idea. But uh, nevertheless, um, I still think, you know, the idea of do no harm and, and is just outdated. We just, we're so beyond that at this point that if we are not teaching people how to regenerate health, then we are doing a huge disservice uh, to humanity. Um, we really have to look at lifestyle medicine plus the regenerative approach. So that really has my attention now, um, which I feel like is beyond mediating symptoms and really addresses um, a shift in a body-wide healing. And it's teaching people what it means to do restorative health, how the body can regenerate, how to shift their microbial um, 
community inside and then use those foods uh, to really harness the healing process. Um, I am a living example, but I've seen it replicated many, many times. It can be done. Uh, it should be done. It's, it's, it's something that people can and should be executing on a regular basis, and they can teach it and model it for, them, for their own community and their own family. Um, I always tell people the onset of disease is happening long before you ever see the symptoms. So we can't really be talking about prevention anymore. Prevention is a joke. I mean, prevention is, you know, by the time people are motivated to do prevention, they're already in a disease pathology. Nobody is motivated by prevention. Nobody. It's just, it's, it's not even on the, it's just, is not something people can talk about. Okay, because the only people that are motivated to change their health are sick people. Right? So we really have to help people understand that the body is already corroding. I mean, when I, at 35, was told I was disabled, they said I was already degenerating and they wanted to put steel rods in my back. So if I was corroding and degenerating at 35, and by the way, uh, teenage boys are getting that same diagnosis now. So my son who runs cross country, uh, healthy 14 and 15 year old boys are being told universally now, uh, and my husband teaches t uh, tennis, that they have uh, degenerative disease. And that's what's being recommended. They're getting steroid shots, they're getting extensive interventions uh, for degenerative disease at age 14. Strong looking young boys, athletes. All of them are sick. All of them. Broken bones, deteriorating ligaments, joints that are deteriorating, all of them are out sick. So I can tell you right now that the tissues are not holding up. The tissues are breaking down much, much younger. Um, so in terms of nerve degeneration, I mean, we have, we have documentation that the, that the uh, compounds in our food can actually regenerate nerves in the body. The key component, and I was talking with somebody earlier uh, about this, is that you have to have a healthy microbiome to help metabolize these components. You cannot bring healthy nutrients into the body, into a sick body that doesn't have a bacterial ecosystem that can work with this information. So remember where I was talking to you earlier and I said, you know, we essentially were taking in low levels of glyphosate and our system was sort of compromised and then we couldn't get access to those nutrients and therefore we didn't have the building blocks. So if I was dumping in really healthy food or I was taking in certain nutrients, it wasn't really doing us any good, okay? So when you have a good, strong microbiome, because you're not damaging it with antibiotics or glyphosate or processed food or non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like Advil and you're not taking in you know, processed oils and all kinds of crap, you're not damaging right, your microbial community. And then you bring in healthy, rich food, rich in polyphenols and all these incredible compounds and flavonoids and you bring in that data you bring the information encoded in the food, and then the microbes eat it and metabolize it and produce secondary byproducts that then get into the cells and give your body those essential building blocks, then you have restoration, right? So you can't have a chronically inflamed body and then take a high dose curcumin supplement and say, oh, I'm good, I'm, I'm not gonna get dementia. I'm totally not getting dementia, right? I mean, it doesn't work that way, right? Liver regeneration, these are some of the compounds that have been shown uh, to, to do restoration, although the liver is quite an extraordinary organ um, in terms of restoration. Beta cell res uh, regeneration. Again, curcumin, I think, is probably the most uh, well-studied and documented herb, so that's always on the list for some reason. Um, and, um, and then spine regeneration. Uh, these are the ones that came up. I just want to check, do a time check. Um, eating real food, of course, uh, is always my message because um, in today's world, there's certainly a diet for everything, and I think it's really important to understand that the terrain always trumps dietary theory. So I, to me, whatever diet you feel is the right diet for you is important uh, for you to really come to terms with. I feel uh, the, 
the terrain is critical. So you can have the perfect diet, but if your body has the wrong terrain, then it's likely you're going to produce lipopolysaccharides that are going to get where they don't need to be, which is on the other side of your epithelial lining, and therefore you will have inflammation. So it's really, really important that you understand that you have to have a strong ecosystem inside, and that is your number one focus. You have to move from there and then uh, work with the diet after that. Always aiming for quality and diversity, um, getting access to minerals through food grown in biodiverse soil. Um, I'm not going to go through these foods. I always have examples of foods that are commonly available in our grocery store, and the reason for that is because I don't want people to feel like they have to use foods that are complex or hard to get to or that there's something very um, special about certain types of nutrients. The fact of the matter is that Mother Nature has embedded all kinds of incredible compounds right into the ordinary foods that we use every day. We just have to be willing to bring them into the body on a consistent basis and recognize what, what they have in them. So when people have certain types of ulcers or things in the stomach, I mean, in cabbage and in celery, we have things that will combat H. pylori, which is the bacteria that we know uh, leads to a lot of stomach ulcers and gastrointestinal issues. So we really have these things built in and we just have to utilize them. Same thing with herbs. Herbs are one of the most powerful things on the planet that people just underestimate and often don't use, but they should be used regularly. And the nice thing about herbs is they tend to be more resilient anyway. Um, the way that they grow, their wild tendency. Uh, people need to incorporate wild foods in their diet because uh, their very nature is to be more resilient. They're sort of the most persistent plant. Um, so the, we sort of take on those characteristics when we bring them into the body. So uh, to the extent where you can do that, I highly recommend that. Same thing with their, uh, they tend to be antibacterial, antifungal, so they keep that respiratory system uh, in check. And so that was, is going to keep you from having to go down the antibacterial or you know, antibiotic route because you're going to be incorporating these things on a regular basis to keep the body strong and resilient. Um, digestive enzymes are always often built into our foods naturally, and so we don't really want to be incorporating uh, too many digestive enzymes in the form of supplementation when, when we don't need to, um, so we don't really use those anymore. Turmeric, uh, we talked about a little bit, but of course, um, using the whole root if you can. Uh, same thing with wild blueberries, anything wild you can get. Um, and then spices, preventing, um, using spices, of course, is very powerful too. Turmeric, pepper, clove, ginger. Um, I would say ginger is probably my number one uh, root, if you could keep that in your house all winter long. It'll kill almost anything, um, literally. Uh, so any type of infection, upper respiratory, gastrointestinal, ears, um, Migraines has been shown to be much more powerfully effective, uh, and research shows uh, against migraine pain um, than any pharmaceutical drug. So you want to just keep ginger root in the house at all times. So I highly recommend that. Uh, the basic principle, of course, is to eliminate irritants, add in nutrient-dense food, treat health over disease. I'm simplifying, but of course, uh, that is the basic premise of my message. And uh, if we don't do that, then ultimately we, this is what we'll all come, this is the veterinarian diet, um, and this is where we'll end up, I think, uh, it's the next diet on the list. Uh, health conditions, of course, never occur in one organ of the body. Uh, we always have to treat the whole body, and this leads to my final recommendation, which is, of course, to avoid high-dose monotherapy. We certainly want to don't, don't do high-dose monotherapy in farming, but certainly in human health, um, healing properties can never be isolated to a single nutrient or compound. And uh, there is a synergistic effect in nature uh, provides that speaks certainly to our microbial world um, that we don't fully understand. And I think we just have to honor and respect that um, and recognize that it is doing things inside the body that we just have to uh, have faith in. And attempting to isolate the healing process can often lead to imbalances and unexpected consequences. So I think it's very, very important that we try not to overthink the healing process 
and we uh, act as a way of just nudging, nudging it along and providing those building blocks and trust that the human body knows how to heal itself um, with our support. So with that, I think I probably have just a couple of minutes left. Um, this is how you can reach me uh, to reach out. Uh, my story was uh, documented in the documentary film, which was just released nationwide, which is Secret Ingredients. Uh, you can certainly see that that's available online. It's streaming uh, on iTunes, on DVDs. So you see a little bit more detail into our story and uh, the, 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 our family story, as well as many of my uh, clients are in the film with other issues like fertility and uh, digestive issues and, and other types of things. So certainly can sh it's a nice way to share that with your family and friends if you want to uh, open up that conversation and talk about the impact of glyphosate in food and its healing capacity. So that's a really nice way to, um, to share the share the message. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was curious, a couple of beneficial bacteria that you mentioned, I can't remember if there were two in particular, uh, Bacillus, let's start with an F. Were those considered probiotics? They can be. I mean, some of them are available in, in foods, kimchi and sauerkraut and um, fermented foods. And um, so certainly you can get them in fermented foods. You know, oftentimes you will find them in a probiotic form. I'm not necessarily a big fan of taking probiotics. We clinically use them very rarely these days um, for very specific reasons. Uh, so, for example, Bacteroides, um, you want to take that? Oh, oh um, so Bacteroides longum is an example of a particular bacteria that helps upregulate other types of bacteria. Um, so I'm actually a little bit more interested in other types of species of probiotic bacteria that then upregulate um, and increase bacteria that we're not actually even supplementing. So for example, I'm giving, back to, I'm giving Bacteroides longum, but I'm actually seeing an increased growth in other types of species. So um, even though that, what I was saying in that particular example is the Bacteroides fragilis uh, showed to modulate or decrease Im immunity, the idea wouldn't be then to throw in Bacteroides fragilis in a supplement of, because most bacteria are pretty transient. They don't survive the stomach acid. Most of them never get to the colon where they belong, and half of them, I mean, almost none of them inoculate. So the research shows that they don't actually um, inoculate the intestine, and there's really no benefit to taking them. They're not really penetrating and staying. Um, what you would then, what you would, the bigger question there would be, uh, what where is, where is it naturally available, and then what foods do Bacteroides fragilis like? Uh, so, like in the example with the Prevotella, I was interested in terms of autism, uh, what foods, what foods help Prevotella grow, like like the um, fibers, right? So, so you always want to be asking that question, right? And now you, and, and then the other thing is that you might you don't know if you're low in that particular species and why you might be low. So sometimes other bacteria are just crowding it out. So there may be some small amounts of it. Well, there are a lot of, there are, yeah, there are a lot of different um, tests. We used uh, different tests for different reasons. Uh, I like tests that use, um, that look at the DNA uh, of the microbiome as well because I like to look at other immunological markers. Um, because I think that I like to look at lots of other data. I like to look at viruses, um, and I like to look at secretory IgA activity, which looks at your first line of defense and to see what your um, immune system is doing um, in addition to other things that are happening there. Um, so I think that I think you can never just look at a snapshot of the bacteria. Again, because I've, I've looked at microbiomes of people, and on paper, I would expect them to be very sick, and they're very healthy. And then the people who actually look, it, it's the opposite, right? So the, the people on paper that I would expect to be very sick are he healthy, and the people that on paper that are, that are very sick are, are, are not. Yeah, it's, it's, so it's deceiving, right? It's, it's not the presence of the bacteria as much as what are they doing. How are they behaving, right? 
what it, what's, what's the presence there, what's the viral activity. What we also see a lot too is that um, people can have a very complex microbiome, but it's the viral activity in the body that's creating the problem. So they have very active uh, herpetic viruses that are, not, that are not in check. And so that's creating a bigger, bigger problem for them. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah, I'll go back. To, I'll go back to the liver regeneration, and then I'll take another question. It, the black. Yeah. Um, I heard that uh, they Yeah, so your question is, is that true that they're not getting exposed to the? Right, and how would you um, mm. get that back? Yes, yeah, so when the babies come down to the microbiome, they're getting their first inoculation. Um, we actually, uh, that's actually not true. The, the first inoculation is actually happening even in the placenta. So we used to think that the placenta was sterile and the placenta is actually not sterile. So uh, there is some initial exposure uh, in the placenta, and in fact, the placenta has a similar microbiome to the mouth of the mother. Um, so the microbiome of the mouth, of the species of the mouth, is very comparable to what we see in the placenta in terms of species or type. Um, so I. That's not such a it's not a concern. I find it. No. I, well, I find it interesting. I often wonder if the mother's. Um, exposing the, taking the environment in through the mouth and then sharing that data. Um, so that's just my own theory. In other words, to educate the baby about what uh, is, what environment they're coming into. Uh, so that would be my own theory. That's not, that's not scientific literature yet, we'll see. But uh, so when the baby comes down to the birth canal, yes, through the mucosal eyes, mouth, uh, and s swallowing the, uh, swallowing the vag vaginal fluids, is the first inoculation. So the other thing to remember too is that during the different trimesters of pregnancy, the microbiome of the vagina changes. So during uh, the final stage of the third trimester, uh, in preparation for the baby, there is a very large uh, fluctuation of lactobacillus bacteria. So the body actually prepares and shifts and changes. So the species of bacteria change significantly in preparation for that actual birth. Um, and so then that's, that's exactly what happens. And then, of course, generally what happens is a mother has a bowel movement during birth. And so the, in essence, uh, the attempt there is to expose the baby to the fecal matter uh, at the time of birth as well. So usually there's a little bit of fecal matter that gets into the um, thing. And I think practices have changed. And then, of course, the skin-to-skin -skin contact. And then the, re the seeding of that bacteria happens with the breast milk. So there are very specific oleosaccharides, which are sugars in the breast milk that have no purpose uh, in the human body. The only reason they're in the breast milk is to feed the microbiome. So, and that's a large percentage of the breast milk initially. So the, in full, you can see right there Mother Nature at its best uh, to do that. So. I have a question about lectins mm -hmm. in, uh, in foods, healthy foods. Yeah. And the second question has to do with PTSD in children from abuse, neglect, mm. trauma, and so basic brain um, malformations. Yeah. And how um, you know how one can address those sorts of things that don't seem to be addressed at all in our mental health world right now. Right. Yeah, uh, in just in pediatrics. Well, it's, but, it has consequences for the life of that individual, right? Right. In society, so um, <clears throat> how does one, especially wards of the state, or poverty uh, situations, or right. uh, you know, children of the war, and so how does one begin to even address uh, you know these concepts? Yes. To where do you begin? How does that start? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, you know, um, 
I think we all have. Uh, I think adults, too, carry a lot of post-traumatic stress disorder. And certainly, um, when people are sick, uh, you know, there's a lot of post-traumatic stress disorder even once you're ill. Um, I talk a little bit about this. I talked about it, I think, during the end of one of our film uh, premieres, where uh, it can be very traumatic to come out of the situation that we were in and not be afraid that we were going, that I was going to slip back. So I had a lot of post-traumatic stress disorder um, from that. And I actually, I don't know if you, the, the picture of me um, in doing the triathlons, that was a comeback from, I had been attacked by 240 pound Akitas. So I was, that was a rehabilitation. I, d I ended triathlons because I had post-traumatic stress disorder from an attack. Uh, they severed the IT band in my right quadricep, and my right arm uh, attacked me in a parking lot, and I actually thought I was going to die, uh, and because I, they were going to rip me apart, and I went into shock. And because I went into shock, uh, I froze, and so they just locked on. Uh, they put their teeth through my flesh, and a couple of men came and found me and ripped and, and pried their mouths off, put me in the back of a van, and drove me to a hospital. So I ended up having post-traumatic stress disorder from that attack and then, you know, had years of this. So I knew by the, so when I was then disabled years later and had back surgery and paralysis, I think it was a resurgence of the post-traumatic stress disorder from that attack 10 years prior. And so I, I know what, you know, when people have these situations and we carry these things up, they can, can reemerge in the central nervous system for sure. And so what I like to say to people, and we certainly see this in the youth population, I did work for a nonprofit that served 40,000 people uh, in the state of Rhode Island um, with special health care needs. And so it is um, a very complex thing and an important subject. My, my answer to that is that when we, when we look at the health of the whole body and we look at this ecosystem, Remember I talked about those microbes and how they give off these metabolites that really uh, secrete GABA and serotonin and norepinephrine? Uh, this, the, this is our inner pharmacology, right? And we cannot be calm and relaxed and we cannot tap into our ability to get through those emotional uh, traumas if we don't have those microbes to support us. Uh, because they're really traveling up and down that vagus nerve and calming the central nervous system. And so for me, I don't know that I would have had the bandwidth to, to cope with that or to deal with that, and even with our children and everything that they had been through. So I feel like that's the entry point for people. I don't feel like we can ask people to, to deal and cope with those kinds of things if they don't have that foundation. I really feel like that's the entry point, that we have to get people well enough before we can even go there to do some of that emotional work and to get there. Because then what we're really doing is we're saying, you know, you ha we have those resources inside to pull from. So I feel like it has to start there and then, and then we can get into some of that, some of that work. I really do. I, I don't think we, because otherwise we're just trying to add the drugs in and the calming techniques and other things. Yeah. Oh, the lectins. Oh, yeah, the lectins are so popular because it's, you know, of different books. Um, I always get text messages from all my clients when these books come out. I'm like, oh. <laughs> skag. Okay. Uh, do I think you should be avoiding lectins? Is that the question? Or what's your take on eating healthy foods but not caring about the lectins? Well, you, the microbes will break down the lectins. So if you are not digesting lectins, um, you, you have a weak system. So my suggestion would be not to avoid healthy foods um, because you can't break down lectins. What are lectins in? All healthy foods. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, I mean, just the basic, like if you just think about, you know, I'm not going to eat potatoes and spinach and, stuff, you know, strawberries. Uh, what's that? Beans. And beans and yeah. Great. So I mean certain grains. Yeah, we can make things more digestible. I think people I think people are more sensitive because we are sick. And the system our systems are not are I think our systems are reacting to lectins. But so the answer is not to avoid lectins. Right? The answer is to become strong 
and have an ability to cope with elections so that we can be healthy, wonderful.